Hi, this is Trevor from Physics This Week. Today let's talk about some simple spring systems. And by the end of this presentation, we're going to talk about the uh, setup of an oscillating spring problem. The setup isn't terribly difficult, but there are some subtleties that I want to point out to you. Once you know those subtleties, uh, it actually is very simple to set up. And then we're going to talk about the relationships between the speed, position, and the acceleration of the mass uh, that happens to be oscillating on this spring. Remember, we went through a lot of mathematics, starting out with Newton's second law. We looked at the forces, we wrote an algebra equation, we played around, and we got to this final form that the mass times the acceleration is equal to negative ky. And in fact, let's write it in that direction. And let's think about what's going on here. This is the acceleration. This is the second derivative of y with respect to time. If I divide both sides by m, I get k over m on this side. The negative is following down along because of the form of the equation above. Once you've played with these types of things quite a bit, you realize that this guy, if it were a squared term, it would make the math a lot easier to write. It would make it a lot easier to play with. So I'm going to do a mathematical trick. This is not one that you might think of at this point in your physics career, but later on, keep it in your back pocket as a nice little mathematical trick you can do. I'm not changing the value of anything. All I'm going to do is write omega equals the square root of k over m, with this, and then I'm going to square that, put it back into the equation. The reason that I want to do that is I'm taking a second derivative, and oftentimes, because of the way the chain rule works, I end up with a term in here that is squared. Let's take a look at this omega. If we look carefully at the units for this, Omega is given in units of newtons per meter, which are the units for the spring constant divided by the mass uh, units of kilograms. We can change this a little bit by writing kilogram meters per second squared in place of the newtons. M drops to the bottom and the kilograms is already down here. The kilograms cancel, the M for meters cancel, and we're left with one over second squared of course, with the square root still surviving. But then we take that square root and we're left with units of one per second, which is also known as a hertz, which of course is a frequency measurement. In particular, omega is called the angular frequency because of the, the fact that this motion uh, can be thought of as a form of circular motion. So circular motion and rotational motion and harmonic motion are all related. So now we want to pick out a mathematical function that actually works with this differential equation. Remember, y is going to be a function of time and it's going to measure the position of the object. Now we know that the second derivative looks like the first derivative with this negative and some constant squared out front of it. We know that if we map it out in time, and draw a graph of that, that the motion looks sinusoidal. In other words, it looks like a sine or a cosine function. We want to guess that the motion looks like one of these one of these equations. Now notice here first, I've done a cosine omega t, and the cosine function is one I'm going to use here because it looks just like a cosine function. If the beginning of this were shifted a little bit. In other words, if we had started our time here, we could actually use a phase angle in there to shift that uh, and still be able to describe the motion. If we moved even further, in fact, if we started our time here, it would look just like a sine function. And again, a sine and a cosine function are very similar. The difference would be the phase angles would be different. And of course, the phase angles would depend on when we actually start our stopwatch. Finally, and this one isn't quite as obvious as the others, it could be some combination of sines and cosines, which we could write as an exponential function. Typically, you won't use this, at least not until later uh, versions of physics, uh, but for the time being, let's pick one of these guys to use. 
So now we want to know if our function actually works. So I've plotted out uh, y of t equals positive a cosine omega t. We want to see if the pattern is matched uh, in our equation of motion. Okay, so we take the first derivative. When we do that, the first derivative of sine, or co excuse me, cosine is sine. We pick up a negative from that. We pick up a omega. That omega comes from the chain rule uh, on the sine omega t. Then we want to take the second derivative. The sine turns back into a cosine function. No change in the sine out front, but we do pull out an additional omega from that, and this is, in fact, the acceleration. So it looks like we do have the case where our original function y, the cosine a omega t, take two derivatives of it, and we get our original function along with this omega squared and the negative out front. So this description actually does work. So now let's take a look at these functions plotted out uh, versus time. So notice we start out here at our maximum height. We lift this guy up, we're ready to let it go. As it falls, the position drops. Eventually it's going to reach its lowest point and then it's going to start to come back up. As it's doing that, the speed or the velocity of it is speeding up and then slowing down, coming to a stop down at the bottom and then working its way back up. Likewise, the acceleration at the beginning, it the spring has its minimum pull on it. So the spring is pulling the smallest that it can. As time goes on, it reaches the equilibrium point and then continues on till you get the maximum force uh, at the bottom of the motion. So this mathematical model that we picked out gives us the behavior that we want, which is the whole point of using a mathematical model. Okay, now in review, the best place to put that origin is right at the equilibrium point of the system. That way we can oscillate around this spot and not have to worry about offsets, not have to worry about uh, anything else that could potentially make it look more complicated than it really is. The equations of motion are sinusoidal. You can either choose the sine or cosine depending on where you want to start the motion at. And finally, the velocity and acceleration are just the first and second derivatives of our motion. Okay, so I hope this helps you understand uh, simple harmonic motion for a spring system a little bit better. Talk to you next time.